Um, my name is Rosalia Guerreiro. I session. I'm a teacher here in the Department of Architecture at Lisbon University Institute. So we will uh, are four minutes late. So we will start with um, Lini Assar and Pedro Januário with the um, the title Building Circulation from a Synthetic Contest in Relation to Indoor Thermal Environment. And Lynn, you have such a beautiful screen. <laughs> we are here talking about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I, I cannot share my screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Is it clear? Can you see it? Okay. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lian. I'm, I'm glad to be here today to present this work that I'm doing uh, for my uh, PhD thesis with the help of uh, my supervisor, Professor uh, Pedro Januario. <laughs> Um, the, the paper is entitled Building Circulation from a Syntactic Context in Relation to Indoor Thermal Environment. So it contains two uh, fields of study, the building circulation and the indoor thermal environment. Uh, the reasons behind this research idea is that, well, buildings are essentially used to, uh, um, are constructed to provide people uh, to protect them from extreme outdoor conditions. With the nowadays uh, concerns of limits of the non-renewable energy sources, uh, the research has been um, uh, directed towards optimizing design parameters and not only focusing on uh, construction techniques and materials uh, to, to reduce energy consumption. Uh, also, uh, even with the huge amount of research is done to confirm the um, effect of, um, of the improved building fabric over the energy consumption, still the amount of um, heating and cooling required for the buildings is, is quite significant. Um, also, the idea that there are some design decisions that are taken especially to uh, decide the spatial structures of buildings, they are being taken in very early uh, stages uh, of the design and they are uh, almost very hard to change later on in the life cycle of the building. And therefore, in this research, we're trying to propose a new thinking approach. Um, Let's, let's, okay. Uh, first, let's talk a little bit about the building circulation. I'm sorry, is, is my voice um, clear? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. So, um, the, what we mean by building circulation are the spaces that are used to circulate people around. So they include uh, as we can see, corridors, ramps, uh, elevators, stairways, and uh, other uh, physical paths of uh, movement. These spaces are actually, um, uh, they are key organizing elements of layouts. They connect interior spaces, they create the flows, they link the activities, uh, they establish the building's exterior connection, they reflect the overall organization of the building, they make up a great amount of the building's area and they are actually places designed for movement of uh, people through, around and between spaces of the built environment. Um, regarding the design of these spaces, we as designers usually have codes that we need to comply with 
um, uh, regarding, for example, security, safety, and performance for, for these spaces. Uh, therefore, there are many methods that have been developed to uh, optimize uh, areas, to optimize length of journeys, either by um, metric length or by duration of time. However, what we're trying to um, say here that um, circulation is not merely an optimization. It should be thought of as a positive element, element that affects how we understand the building, how we um, our perception of the building and our perception of the form of the shape of the building. And that's why this approach is trying to shed light on the syntactic context of these spaces to, com to combine their semantic and behavioral approach. Um, so circulation from a syntactic context, uh, the, the different definitions of circulation uh, they, they talk about the concept of accessibility, that circulation are spaces that offer accessibility to other spaces. Um, it, they talk about how the different disposition, the different arrangement of boundaries between these spaces are what structures uh, and organizes movement inside the, these buildings. And this accessibility uh, offers or imposes somehow a, a kind of um, control. Uh, which differentiates spaces into private and public spaces and makes uh, leads into a, a kind of a hierarchy uh, in, in the ordering of these spaces. Um, so, for example, in buildings where uh, we have a large amount of control for the circulation or in buildings where the major part of the venue is circulation, like, for example, uh, airports and train stations and hospitals and schools, we can see that circulation constitutes uh, the main factor producing the spatial organization of the building uh, and also its form. Uh, from the space syntax uh, approach, the theory uh, considers the configurational approach, which is the topological nature for modeling uh, networks and for calculating uh, syntactic measures. And this is based uh, on spatial adjacencies of places rather than just metric distances between them and rather than the ex their exact locations, but their relations to each other. And uh, some of the, therefore, some of the syntactic measures that we're, we, we will be considering in this research are the basic measures for um, uh, this theory, which are the connectivity. The connectivity indicates um, uh, the spaces that have direct effect on each other. Integration indicates the amount of um, um, movement inside these spaces. And control, which indicates to how extent a space can have um, an effect over the movement in other spaces. Now, let's talk a little bit about the building indoor environment. Um, as we can see, of course, the indoor environment affects human health, it affects comfort and performance. Uh, it is directly related to minimizing energy consumption and natural resources consumption. Um, the successful indoor environment should take into consideration all the multiple parameters that are included in the design of the building. Um, many terms are used to talk about the indoor environment. Each of them have different factors affecting them. Uh, we're considering here the thermal environment or the thermal comfort, which is mainly concerned with factors of air temperature, um, um, air humidity, and air velocity, uh, among others. When we look at the indoor environment from a thermal approach, uh, we see the definition of thermal comfort in ASHRAE standards, uh, which says uh, it is the conditions that affect a person's heat of loss, or heat loss. And in the ISO standards, a condition obtained when the internal heat production in the body is equal to the loss of heat to the environment. So um, these de definitions indicate that people's comfort and discomfort status comes directly from temperature and moisture. And these two, along with the air velocity, 
are the bases used for calculating heat balance, for calculating energy loads that are required to achieve thermal comfort uh, inside buildings. Um, so now I'm going to display or present um, a number of cases, case studies, researches that have been done. Uh, some of them are regarding the impact or the application of syntactic measures over uh, different aspects of design, different aspects of life. Uh, and then uh, other cases that uh, try to relate these um, the circulation measures to indoor thermal uh, measures. And then we can come out of the logic, um, talk about the logic that, uh, um, that brought this research idea. So regarding syntactic cases, of course, there are so many applications for the syntactic measures. Um, we have an interesting one in the first diagram here above where uh, Natapov and others in, in 2015 used syntactic analysis to redesign circulation pattern while preserving the same uh, organization of the building. And this was for the aim of creating easier uh, wayfinding. Um, while in the, in the second diagram, um, as Norian, Norian and others um, using the same syntactic measures in a parametric uh, environment, well, they were used to see how possible it is to reach concrete uh, plan layouts from very basic abstract connectivity uh, uh, diagrams. Um, also, we have uh, many researchers, but some of the researchers, for example, the Narvaez tried to show how syntactic approach can be used to decode um, uh, economic variables in the city, uh, others some social variables. And another interesting research, uh, Vogan in 2007, managed to relate how ringy spatial structures in, in, of a city, a certain city, was able to reduce the CO2 emission uh, inside that city. Um, the other type of cases uh, here are the ones that try to show how circulation or other factors affected indoor environmental uh, cases. So um, for example, in the first one, Doblestein and others managed to show how different shapes, different uh, circulation uh, schemes and different um, stacking typologies of buildings were able to affect the um, the, the energy use or this, the, um, the environmental life cycle of the building. Uh, also, we have a research for Roulette uh, in 2001 where uh, the spatial arrangements, he, he talked about the effect of spatial arrangements on um, how they affect the comfortable living environment. Um, Another interesting one by Dogen in the diagram here, we can see that he managed to show that there is about 15% difference in energy use if we use different interior subdivisions inside the building. And so after all of these information and these case studies, um, these studies have confirmed that there is a relationship between uh, the, the building shape and the building circulation scheme uh, along with the indoor environmental uh, measures, uh, but they were measured in geometrical aspect. Uh, what we're suggesting here is that syn the syntactic approach suggests that we measure spatial settings uh, in, from a, a topological um, um, aspect rather than a geometrical one because the density of and the volume of movement, it, it is affected more by uh, the spaces locations to each other rather than the actual geometric length between them. And um, the, the idea that uh, building circulation are spaces assigned mainly for the movement of people, but not only that, they also move um, uh, energy and materials between them. So it is assumed that these spaces might have an effect over the indoor environment. Um, Space Syntax managed to develop tools and uh, models that related syntactic measures to a range of social, economic, and environmental aspects. 
uh, just like the urban mo movement model and the land use model. So it might as well be related to other measures. And therefore, uh, this research idea um, uh, came, which is actually, it's only- You have more two minutes, please. Yes, okay. Um, so it's actually only a theoretical review. It's only in the beginning, um, in the early stages of the work. Uh, so it's a theoretical review that performs a cross thinking between the two different fields of uh, building circulation and indoor thermal conditions. It proposes that there is a relationship between uh, syntactic spatial measures to indoor thermal measures. So it, it says that thermal sources of heat, air and humidity uh, do move and accumulate inside buildings just like, just like human beings do. Uh, for the future work, we need to validate uh, this proposition, and we already started this work. Uh, we need to, we'll be simulating these cases spatially and analyzing them against the, the indoor thermal measures, establishing a cause effect relationship uh, to reach some sort of a mathematical relationship so that we can use these spatial measures predictively of the thermal environment. And we're suggesting to use a, a multi-objective optimization method in a parametric environment um, uh, to, to offer the ability to control these two sets of variables and uh, understand their um, effect on each other. And all of that is for the objective of finally reaching a syntactic thermal, a syntactic thermal design model um, using very abstract preliminary design decisions. Uh, this would offer designers and architects uh, uh, real-time feedback on every design move they do. It would hopefully improve the great the, the indoor thermal environment and the architectural design practice. These are the references and thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, you are muted. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn, for your presentation. We are moving now to the presentation of Maria João Oliveira uh, with a paper with Filipe Osório uh, with the title Nature Pleated Surfaces. Well, tell us. Yes. I hope so. Okay, go ahead. Got a mask. Everybody sees my screen. Yes, he's working. Do you hear me? Did I answer? So we can we can see it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to start to present nature plated surfaces, with, which was um, a workshop that uh, me and Filippo conducted uh, last year at ECA de Sigrade, 19, uh, 2019. And this was an experience because it uh, joined our uh, two PhD thesis uh, research. Uh, from Philippa came the, the big team of the, the origami, the origami patterns and the parameterization through origami uh, degrees and, um, and their rules. And for me, from my PhD thesis came the, the the biomimetics uh, team uh, and the mat a methodology to uh, develop a, pro a project based in nature and um, using uh, several steps that I'm going to, to explain. So uh, trying to simplify this complex diagram, um, the, the, the bazillions of the, the question, really it is the biomimetics they join together and, and it, it goes further in, in the study of plants specifically and terrestrial vascular plants, which is the, the, the core of, the, of this study. And then the origami, um, the study of the movement and how we could produce um, 
uh, flat rigid origami, which is very different and very different from flexible origami. It has specific rules and uh, joining is uh, gluing this together. We have the performance-based design and the use of parametric, parametric tools as well as uh, simulation. And to, to our participants at this workshop and, uh, and to ourselves during the study, trying to combine our PhD thesis, we uh, have uh, studied several projects that we, we are going to, to name it. One of, them, one of them was this Oribotics from the Gardenier, which is uh, basically in a very, very short description are some uh, luminous flowers that open and close closes through the movement of uh, uh, ori rigid, rigid origami. And they produce this very uh, simply, uh, simply movement um, you, um, through the sense of the, uh, the, princess, the presence of the, um, the visitor of the inhabitant of the space. And then we have the Bloom and Woman, which is another uh, very impressive, impressive uh, structures. They are very, very big structures. They are uh, populate uh, um, large spaces like this one at the concert. And they provide not only uh, 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 light, but also provide sh shade during, uh, during the day. And then we have more abstract combinations of biomimetics with origami, such this uh, uh, experience from the Tall Friedman, the Tall Friedman Pavilion, and where they use um, the a single material and they fold it and they produce this structure, or the butterfold, uh, an experience in uh, Santa, Santa Fira, uh, the, uh, the University of Santa Fira, um, which produce also a shading system for um, a stair that achieved the, the, the university. Another example is this uh, festival concentrical pavilion, which uses origami logics in a very different ways because it's not the material that it folds itself, but uses some uh, metal joints. And another example with a, a plus in the joints, not the, the, the basic material, it uses another ones and other components to, to join the several pieces. We have this experience, which is the Look Look Pavilion from the Morrison Studio. And now we provided our, um, we, we were very uh, rigid in, in our workshop. We have, we have only eight hours to do this. And so we, have, we were very uh, restrict um, establishing the, the, the goals and the, the structure of our, our workshop. So we stated that theory, uh, the theory, at the theory point, we needed the, that they establish not only the function and the final goal of the structure that they want to produce, but we also imposed to them that they had to produce a self-supportive self structure. And then they had to uh, base their study and base their structures on the biomimetic study of the terrestrial vascular plants uh, adaptation strategies, which I'm going to try to explain resumedly uh, in a very resumed way. And then they had to produce uh, some generative form that, um, uh, that um, respected the, the rules of the origami and also um, the fundamentals of the biomimetic issues that they are going to study. And then they have the materialization, which was also uh, were mostly uh, virtual. So some basic things about origami, we have two, uh, one of them, it's this logic of mountain and valley fold because uh, origami is based on this uh, 180 movement, 80 degree movement. And then we have the three degrees that are essentially uh, the basis of the origami, the degree two, four and six, which means very, uh, very, very fastly. <laughs> that is um, two uh, edges that converge to one vertices. This is the two. The four, it's logic. It's our four edges that converge to one vertices, and the six are six edges that converge to one uh, vertices. This was the structure. The structure that our participants had to conduct, which we had this first first domain, which is architecture, and at the architecture stage are located, the, um, is located the, the, the origami part. They had to identify the, the, the function of their structure. They had to an analyze um, inside the origami rules and degrees, which one could fit their structure. And then they could do, produce a diagnose 
of the, the project that they will produce. And this is, the, as a result, is the, the challenge or definition of their own project. And then we have the nature domain that has three stages. And the first one is to discover inside the plant, the, vest, the terrestrial vesicle plants, which are the morphological strategies adaptation that could fit and help to improve and, and, um, and develop their project, explore this because we didn't, um, we didn't want that they, they produce something linear, something that, oh, okay, so the, this plant open and close. So our structures are going to open and close. So we didn't want this linear thought. We wanted that they explore something more and do an, um, a more abstract, uh, no, a more abstract uh, idea. And then the conceptualization, which is very important because it's the construction of the biomem. It's the biomimetic map. So it's a map, it's an image that they, each person, in this case, each group are going to produce that will lead the idea of the generation for the, the, the third domain, which is the artifact. So this was some basic diagram that we provide some of the functions and the components of the plants, some, one, uh, some very, very basic ones. And then we provide to them, and I'm dancing with this, uh, um, uh, we provided them a short list of some morphological strategic uh, strategies of adaptation of the plants, the terrestrial ones, that they could use during the creation of the biomem. This is some um, explanation of how they had to fill the first table of the project, which is the selection of the, the event, which events could fit on the uh, or could fit or could help to, to produce the, the project and how could they extract the main principles of each uh, of each of these events and uh, relate to them after this they had to um, to discover the strategy of each event and from this strategy they will produce the main principles also they, this is also embedded with this information and then after they had to discover the main features the main features that Will have to will help to fill the last of the tables, which is the one that are going to um, to provide or, or to give them the biomem. This is a very simple table, a very a very tactical one, which is by the majority of the of the um, the axis, and they have this fictional mem, which is not in nature actually, but it came from nat nature. And this is the, the motto of their project. So I'm going to sh show you the five projects that emerged. They, they were mostly done by pairs of two. Um, one of the, the groups had three persons. And this one is the, the urban furniture. Each group baptized their project as they wish or as they want. And um, they had this, uh, these questions, all of them, that, that they have to answer. So the goal of this project specifically was to produce a shelter. And this shelter, shelter has to provide shade. And then we have uh, what, kind, what kind of structure they want. So they want actually a shell, so a self-supported shell that could uh, provide these two functionalities. And then they had the selection of the pattern from the, the origami. Or they, they choose the, the D4 kings in the radial mode. This was their construction of the biomem. So we could see that from the initial constraints from the architecture, they maintained the three of them. They went to the dynamic strategy and the project to, uh, were, sele were, were, fit to be, were meant to be dense the, um, at the patterns. And then um, specifically in the radial distributed, distributed, I ah, sorry, <laughs> distributed on the radial mode. This is the conclusion of their biomimetic mem. And these are some evolution of how they wanted to, to produce the movement and how it's going to be populated. This is the fragmentation of a video. Um, and we see that there is some gaps is still to solve in the parametric definition because they, they, didn't, they didn't have time to, to solve the, the these gaps. So the second project, uh, again, the three questions. So they they meant to be a gallery, an art gallery, with a linear, using a linear and a monolayer structure, and uh, uh, using the Yoshimura pattern. The biomem. So from the two initial uh, constraints, they only keep the art the art gallery, and then they went to a dynamic strategy 
with some path with tectonics, and then they choose to, man to maintain the translucent and opaque material features and keeping only the stability as a performative feature. This is the discover of their bioman. And this is the final uh, view of their project. The third one, this was a very funny group because they were very, very happy to do this. And so they are very, really excited to, to, to produce this project. So they wanted to a project that um, to design something that collect water in dry places. Um, the, the, the structures had to be radial and then they baptized their, their pattern because it was a combination of a chicken wire uh, degree four of origami with some adaptation twist with degree uh, six and they call it Colombian and Chilean pattern. These are their nationalities. And then they produced the biomem. The biomem, they kept the initial constraints the, uh, at the pattern le level, they maintain the radial and of course the symmetrical, and then the opaque and flexible material features and using a radial movement and uni unidirectional movement. Of course, that these performative features being a, a static biomimetic map, this was happening only at the pattern level. And this is the the formalization of the biomem, and this was the final uh, project. And then we have the fourth one, which was the production of a plant container with, using a revolution surface and using the D4 um, kink pattern of origami. This group struggles a lot to construct this table because the, the feedback of the, this workshop to us, it was very important, more even than do it. It was to, 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 to have the, the, um, the feedback from the participants because it was the first time that we combined the, the, the two theses. And then this group had some struggles to produce the biomimetic MEM and, and uh, improve us also to, to, to explore how to, we explain our methodology and how we could introduce and integrate better the two PhD theses. This is just an apart, uh, apart consideration. So the biomimetic mem is what of them. It was very rich, and when we have a, this kind of biomimetic mem, we had we have a lot of uh, difficulties to integrate all the, the, um, the combinations. However, they were were able to to produce this uh, this object, which it's not self-supported, but it is self-structured in a way that could handle the the shape of the uh, the radial shape. And then the last one, uh, this was the production again of the shell of a shelter using a flexible and linear structure um, with a chicken wire pat origami pattern. The construction of the biomimetic mem it was easy to this group. Uh, they conserve uh, the two constraint, the initial constraints. Uh, the, it was meant to be a statical uh, strategy using a scalable and monolayer uh, um, structure also, and with opaque and flexible uh, material features and linear movement. This was the final construction. This was the diagram. And the final project, it was uh, this. Of course, I would like to thank all the participants that are not in you. Are not in you. We are here. God, <laughs> words are missing me. Um, and I would like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria João. We are moving now to the presentation of Beatrice Coto with the paper with Sarah Loy with the title Borealis Sound and the Interactive Wall for the Situational Awareness, the Impact of the resp Responsive Architecture on Users. Um, I hope you're already seeing the screen. No? 
Can you share? Don't talk? Oh, you did not. Okay. People can point it. Okay, I'll show you. So, hi, uh, my name is uh, Beatrice. I took my uh, master's degree here in Ishta, and Sara Eloy was once my teacher and co advisor of my master thesis. So, the name of the paper is uh, again a quite big name <laughs> Burialish Sound and Interactive Wall for Situational Awareness The Impact of Responsive Architecture on Users. Uh, yeah, we'll see. So um, there were uh, three main aspects that define the end result of the not all. I'm sorry. Okay, so sorry for that. So the there were this uh, three main of the capital. There were three main aspects that defined the end of proposal. First, um, we were um, doing a reconstruction and expansion design project for um, the School of Music of the National Conservatory in Lisbon. The second one that since it was the um, School of Music, the, um, the aim of the, the proposal was to um, design an interactive multimedia surface that reacts to what characterizes the space and with that, without any doubt, it was the sound. Last but not least, the third uh, aspect was that uh, we identified the problem in the um, School of Music and it was the noisy corridors. If we uh, visit the school now, we can see papers on the door saying, silence, there are classes taking place. So in a briefly way, the paper uh, concerns about the presence of visual communication elements in public spaces using interactive multimedia surfaces. Okay. okay, so the proposal aims to explore the incorporation of digital multimedia surfaces, enhancing the, the new social dynamics while users walk in the interior of the building. So the sound is triggered, um, the visual content is triggered by the sound produced uh, by not all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Experience some trouble, so sorry. Next. Okay. So sorry. Uh, for a recap, uh, the visual contents um, are, trigger, are triggered by the sound produced by the uh, students of the school, um, and uh, it can be triggered also by uh, instruments. Therefore, this uh, proposal has a, a dual goal: that since, uh, in one hand, uh, it acts as an um, entertainment device. And that means that uh, when when this works as an entertainment device, uh, it's uh, outside the um, the time of uh, classes. And uh, on the other end, it acts as a sound control device. So when uh, classes are uh, occurring, there's this um, level of sound that uh, uh, we try to control it with the proposal. 
So regarding the methodology for the project, there are um, three um, stages. So the first, the state of arts, which uh, corresponds to the literature review. And the second one has two moments, the proposal development, the, the technical requirements the, to develop the prototype. And then of course, the evaluation and an analysis of the prototype. So the last chapter is um, with regard to discussion and concluding marks. So state of art, interactive multimedia surfaces. There are two highlights uh, that we should do. It's in terms of classification and approach. In terms of classification, uh, the author Ashton uh, says that uh, responsive buildings are the ones that can uh, anticipate and change their behavior or context according to a schedule. And that, that also means that it always creates an internal user representation. So for the approach, we have one that means uh, that we can create from scratch digital contents to be projected onto a building. The second one, we can capture data from the environment and its uh, interpretation. And the third one is integrating an interaction with the public. So the um, difference between the second and the third is that while the second um, reacts to uh, um, environmental inputs, the last one uh, reacts to human inputs. About the methodological framework, there are no uh, design methods that ensure a proper solution. Uh, we can uh, do part of the, of the development in a methodological way. Uh, and through iterative process and through prototype to test the idea, uh, ideas. Uh, so I think that's like the more we iterate and the more we test, the better uh, should be the, the end result. And there's um, here a concept that means uh, agent theory con concept that comes from artificial uh, intelligence that considers the analysis, the design of complex systems and includes two moments. Uh, one is uh, the directly communication with other objects and that it changed autonomously without an entry or another. In terms of social impacts, it makes total sense to uh, talk about situational awareness, which is a critical foundation for decision make making across a broad range of situations. And it has roots in uh, military action as most of the technology developments nowadays. Some steps for the situation awareness are perception, gathering information about the situation, understanding, comprehending the meaning of the information acquired, and prediction, anticipating the outcome of future events. So here is the methodological system used for the proposal development. And here I just want to state that at the beginning or during the proposal developments, there was other ideas that came out, uh, other types of interaction, such as uh, uh, memory of the path and uh, or by touch, to interact by touch. And uh, like Fudd's first law of creativity says, to get a good idea, get lots of ideas. But the main and initial conditions of the um, proposal here is that the visual effects um, were defined regarding, uh, I'm uh, repeating again, the level, the amplitude and the frequency of the sound. Um, it provides the users um, a sensory experience that entangles them with the combination of sound and visual effects. And it aims to control the volume of the sound in a place where silence, sound, clarity needed and noise reduction during the classes was mandatory. So here for the analysis of the context, we collected six audio samples that are associated with the design scenarios with the goal of matching each sound to a type of situation. So again, uh, remember this um, dual goal. So while the classes were uh, occurring, we made a test with these samples of this sound. And uh, what we get from here is, um, the louder are the students, so there was um, a, a maximum sound level and each time this um, sound level exceeds, the wall became whole red uh, to um, show or to make them feel that they were uh, being too noisy. 
outside of this uh, situation, like during the classes, the entertaining one, we used uh, some uh, samples uh, like bass, acoustic guitar and violin. And there was made a um, chromatic um, um, match between the um, frequency and amplitude with the um, hot colors through uh, cold colors. About the system's specification, the requirements needed to build the proposal, it should be uh, using a lead matrix. Uh, we should need a computer with a very capable graphics card, a controller to drive many matrix models if needed, another computer um, to process the sound inputs and to produce the video signal. And for the um, sound sensor, we should use omnidirectional microphones. And they, uh, the proposal, they are uh, placed along the corridor. About usability testing. Uh, so we did a lo-fi prototype, which is an effective method and commonly, commonly used in design process that focus on user experience. And this method is, um, a uh, good technique because this just not allows the users to see the visual and appearance and the performance, but also in a quickly, it's a quickly way to obtain uh, feedback and criticism in an early development phase. So here are the phases of the test, not including the one that I, we needed to build the prototype and to design the visual content. We had to do a brief uh, on every test and to make the user sign a consent form because the test was being recorded. Uh, all of the visual con uh, content was um, transported manually. At the end of each test, uh, there were some minutes to collect some feedback, some notes, and even to talk a little bit with the user. And at the end, uh, the user had to fill a post-test questionnaire. This post-test was uh, focused on fundamental aspects to validate the relevance and effectiveness of the proposal. We wanted to know if the user was aware of the transformation of the visual content, if uh, they understood the visual content present in each scenario, and if they were aware of the relationship between visual content and sound properties. So how intuitive the interactive effects in the visual content caused by the sound was. So uh, from a sample that, uh, yeah, from one to zero scale, I would say that was a quite positive uh, result since the users, 40% of the users considered it very intuitive. About the discussing and concluding remarks, uh, it means the study, uh, it's a reflection on how media facades can add value and solve identified problems in society. And the proposal uh, could be used in other environments where an automatic triggered alert rather than an audio alarm um, or uh, an alert given give by a person would potentiate a more conscious behavior by users. Um, and another reflection on how multimedia surfaces reshape our relationship with the built environment and in what extent will it change the way we appropriate those spaces. Some other uh, authors uh, said that, um, for example, that um, interactive multimedia surfaces can appropriate normal windows, for example, and to extend the indoor space and to make it bigger or to give a completely different uh, world. And that um, the screens are not just on our phones and computers. They, uh, they have um, a lot to grow still. Uh, so yeah, this is, thank you. Sorry for some interruptions here. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you all for your
for stop sharing. You see my team of Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. So we may have now some minutes for for discussion. We are a little bit up, out of the time, but I think it's still it's still enough. I open now the the debate. Is anyone uh, interested to do some questions, some interactions with the presenters? May I may I ask? Yes, of course. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, my question is to Marie Juan. And uh, it is about the workshop. So did the, the participants have any experience with the tools they used? And what were the main difficulties during the workshop when using the different tools? Uh, the, the participants have no uh, experience on Dynamics. They never have explored anything. Can you hear? I, I can hear. I don't know. I tell it can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, yes, yeah, better. Students <laughs> had no experience on biomimetics uh, uh, on biomimetics field. They had no no background on it, but they had some of them, not all, had some experience on uh, grasshopper and ladybug uh, um, and ladybug uh, simulations, and also uh, the other one, uh, the hybrid. So some of them uh, managed to do this. What we did when we composed the groups was to, to combine a person that has the skills of grasshopper and the other one that has no, no skills of parametric design. And then the groups uh, balance each other and uh, the thing goes, <laughs> goes, goes well. So um, I may say that half of the person, they were uh, 12, I think, 12 or 11, I don't remember exactly. But the, half of them had some experience on parametric tools, and the other ones not. Some of them were professors also, the other ones were students. So it was a very mixed uh, group. And, but the, the core of the, 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 they had no knowledge of biomimetics or origami. So they were at zero stage uh, at this, uh, this phase. Okay. But in the end, if there were uh, in the same team people who had experience and the others not, uh, all the team developed the, the solution or? Uh... All of them um, achieve um, a, desi a designed model. Um, one group did not uh, make it uh, through parametric design uh, and realized it only on Rhino. Uh, basically, and the other four, yes, they achieved to do it everything. Okay. But through parametric. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. More questions? I have, I have a question. I have a question also to also to Maria as well, uh, <laughs> and and my question is. It's very interesting that you join these two PhD theses into one into one uh, workshop. Um, my question is, what when you launched the workshop? So you had a, an idea, and that idea was not, I believe, not just to improve the skills of the, the people in the workshop. So what what is the advantage of using both of your approaches? Why using origami? Next to biodesign, so yeah. What is the advantage? What, what, yeah. So um, the, the goal. Well, it was completely my fault. The, the workshop <laughs> chemical was almost right to it. But the thing was, my PhD thesis based on biomimetics and the study uh, specifically on the functions of the facade. So I have this team. This. Uh, this main domain in architecture, which is the facades and their functions. So the idea was to apply the same methodology, but taking the, the shading systems off and introducing the origami. It was the experience of uh, um, change the model of the architecture and to introduce another, another topic, another architectural topic and how the methodology worked um, worked with with another one with another topic that wasn't good. 
she needs to send this to the, the, the hidden gold. And of course, the Philippa used to uh, to join me this year in the same thing, and it, it was it, it was funny to do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. One more. I have one. Go ahead. Uh, for B three. Hello. <laughs> um, I found your idea about uh, multimedia um, interactive surface very interesting. Um, and I understand the um, potentiality that you are going to explore regarding this idea. Um, however, it was not clear for me, and this is my question, and I would like to highlight a little bit more this correlation between this um, interactive uh, surface, this multimedia interactive surface, and responsive architecture. Um, as we saw in the previous presentation, also about responsive architecture, uh, some other topics were added to uh, the idea of responsive architecture that is not only attached to the uh, surface. Mm -hmm. Uh, we saw in the previous presentations uh, topics like configuration and stuff like that. So um, for me, uh, it would be interesting to understand how do you think you could um, uh, reinforce or make a more robust correlation between the skin, if you want, yeah. and um, an architecture that it's more than skin, it's, it's spaces that. The, the, the program, it's, um, it's the way, it's, it's the thing that you are providing in terms of the data, et cetera. So if you can uh, go um, a little bit more on that topic, for me, it would be interesting to understand um, what kind of um, um, uh, useful things I will bring to architect from this very interesting idea of multimedia uh, interactive uh, surface. Um, I don't know if I can talk yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'll try to say. I think that in the case of uh, responsive architecture, it's like there's a lot of investigation in this uh, field, and um, the one that uh, I I grabbed uh, was that uh, it has an uh, interior I interpretation, and it's like the um, the the the. the the objects, let's call it, it, it knows how the user will behave uh, in front of um, a certain activity. So it, it already uh, ex uh, expects. So uh, there's a lot of ways that I could be, I could use my interactive um, approach inside of the school, but um, I don't know, it, ca it came along the way, like to, to how, 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 how is was going to make um, sense to have uh, this kind of uh, um, interactive wall inside of the school, and then that's why I made this uh, dual goal for for it, not just uh, for the students be rehearsing in front of it, but as a, a, a situational awareness that they know they cannot be doing so much noise. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I answered you about the, the responsive architecture and the interactive multimedia surface. There, there, there are things in common, and there are things that um, only uh, it's up only to responsive architecture. Um, more like the hard thing, or or maybe the facade is moving. It does not um, need interaction. That's the the main um, yeah. the, the main difference that. Yeah. It can be reacting to something else, or the one that I talked about from that uh, reacts from uh, environmental inputs. So this is one way to do uh, responsive uh, architecture. Yeah, the, 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 the interesting I think in your idea is that you are in a way trying to merge um, um, something that is. Uh, in, in, when I think about responsive architecture, I think about a place that is, is, is collecting data about myself, mm -hmm. about me, and my, my mood, my temperature, my, my whatever, and then 
there is a space for me being comfortable in whatever way you want to understand it, uh, physical, mental, whatever. Um, this idea of a multimedia um, interactive surface, we are dealing with um, uh, a thing that, that is not connected to you. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll do bridge those things, uh, or, or is this a multimedia just related to, it's about contents if you want. Uh, when you think about multimedia, you think about contents. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I will react to those contents. Um, when I think about uh, responsive architecture, I think about data being collected from me and something outside me responding to me. Uh, so I'm interested to understand how you bridge these ideas coming from different uh, origins. Yeah, labeled with search, like searching uh, architecture, responsive architecture, multimedia surfaces, interactive multimedia surfaces, and uh, they have uh, other names, <laughs> it's possible to have another names, and I try to uh, to combine uh, a, a bit of the most interesting things that I, I, I found out and that makes sense to my proposal. So, no, yeah. it's so can I, can you are, you are adding an extra level to <laughs> responsive architecture. I find it interesting. Yes, okay, sorry. Can I just add something? So I, I think that indeed what we we we're doing is collecting data from yeah. the user. So the, the, the data in this case is noise. It's yeah. the noise that I do. So the architecture in this case, they are multimedia surfaces, they respond to my noise. What I think that the main or one of the differences between Deirdre work and then uh, Louisa work is that DD had a specific client and she wanted a solution that would be feasible for today, feasible in what senses? Feasible in an economic perspective with nowadays technology. So it would be implementable tomorrow, of course, if the conservatory had the money to buy yeah. that. So but that was the main thing. With the work is more explorative. Um, well, explorative, so it doesn't include this feasibility or this immediate feasibility. Yeah. So I think that those are so the, the, the basis is there, is the same, but then the solutions have different constraints. Sorry, I would, yeah, 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 I think so. The, the, the whole process, like to, to uh, develop the prototype, to be with the users, and to see if they understood what I wanted to uh, transmit with that. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yes, let's say something again about this. Uh, can I even hear? Can you, can you hear? Oh. Yeah, maybe come here. Oh. If it's no, online, the others, yeah. that they, they cannot listen. Yeah, sure, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, is it okay in here? Can you, can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, but it's, it's very interesting. It was really very interesting about the responsible artificial that you mentioned and interactive surface that you put it as a, if I can say a broadcasting yeah. instead of the a multimedia. Um, why you didn't uh, think about, uh, it probably can be a proposal for you or you for expansion mm -hmm. uh, or development of research. Why you are not, thinking about some smart materials yeah. for instance because when if we want to have a wall yeah. with interactive multimedia screen it means you have to have some screen like this size which mm -hmm. costs you a long long yeah, yeah it's yeah. going to be very expensive why are you not thinking about something like smart materials using some non-technology okay. yeah with some non-technology because some in, because the smart material we use the smart materials for in um, in arc in mechanical engineering and civil engineering to even doing some surgeries even now in bio biomedicine mm -hmm. so we can use the same thing in here to responding to the space uh, I mean to responding to the voice to mm -hmm. responding to some interactions between the people and the space but it has to have some uh, genius inside. So that's why we call it smart materials. We have such a material that can react to the orders, 
that comes by some uh, reflections. As I, it was very long time ago that I read about them. Uh, as I know, some of the smart materials can react to the waves. Mm -hmm. Okay, and sounds in your case, yes. especially in your case, sounds are waves. If we can transmit them to some, uh, I don't know, digitally to something that gives some magnetic, uh, mag uh, magnetic uh, cloud or magnetic mm -hmm. things to the wall, it can react to you and it can give you something back. And visibly, as, it, as according to the feasibility cost, mm -hmm. it can be more costable. Uh, I, I, I think it's because smart materials are, uh, in architecture, we are very uh, long from the smart materials, but in here, in, in engineering, mm -hmm. they are very close to that. Probably in design also, we can mix it. Okay, so let's so, move to another direction. Um, and comment some words of the other presenters as well. I think I have a question for, for Lynn. Hello, Lynn. Um, Hello. Um, regard, regarding the environment logic of space that I think you are, you are talking about um, and, and comparing the space syntax and syntactic measures um, with the environmental flaws, um, and as, as space tax um, acts over the social logic of space and the special logic of the social. So how do you uh, make this relationship? I think it's possible through the, the behaviors, if you talk about the behavior of the social, uh, you, can, you can say that is a flaw. So you, 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 you can make a comparison between the flaws and the geometries of the nature and this logic of space. I, I was wondering, and I still believe that space syntax is working over some general laws of nature that can be um, used. I am now looking at Sarah and I remember when we teach here a course of space syntax, she just, she just draw, it was a Christmas time, she just draw a Christmas tree with axial lines. And I was looking at that piece and I still think that the, there is a relationship here that still is not explored. But there are a lot of specialists here in space syntax, maybe uh, somebody can talk a bit about this, but I want to, to hear you. Yes. Um, I was thinking um, uh, and relating them in two ways. The first one would be mathematically. So I'm going to see my results when I analyze certain cases spatially and then analyze them um, um, environmentally and try to find a, a mathematical relationship between uh, these two measures um, um, using the, the cause effect relationship. So through regression and through correlation and try to find uh, if, if there's any relationship or any um, uh, logic behind it. And also using the, uh, the a parametric environment to, to see, uh, to try to control these two to see if uh, there is any relationship between them, but then also there's the uh, the logic that comes of trying to um, explain the these measures to explain these relationships. So um, it, it it will be actually more like um, assumptions, but uh, uh, hopefully um, they will come out of out of the mathematical numbers that we have. So maybe then we can have uh, a behavioral and semantic meaning to these measures, to, to these environmental measures inside the building. Great, thank you. So there is some, some more comments, some more questions? I'd like yes, go ahead. I'd like to, to make the question to Lisa. Um, so following that, 
you have finished your master thesis and that you have that that idea on your do you hear me you're doing the face yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I finished the thesis and now with this emotional idea uh, about architecture and this emotional relationship that you established with it um and working at uh, an art atelier uh, studio, right? Yeah. What will be the, for, the, the following steps? <laughs> the following steps. <laughs> Something materialized on it. And I think it would be a very good challenge for your studio. Why not? Amazing to have that consultant, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <it's really laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. For example, in, uh, in this approach for the paper is more technological and now working in a place like it's more artistic and it's very important uh, concept and uh, the ideas, maybe it would be interesting to combine them to see if the, the art more, more than architecture that can give us emotions more directly than sometimes architecture because architecture can be more um, subtle, subtle, I think. Yeah. Or masked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. But it would be very interesting to, to lead this to a, to a physical project. Yeah, it would be. Responsive art. Yes. <laughs> Responsive art by Ivana Vaskontels and Luis Almeida. Absolutely. <laughs> you should present your work there. Yes. Yeah, maybe they, they already asked me to to show them <laughs> my to make a small presentation about it. I think it would be a very nice challenge. Yeah. When you will enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. We are just in time. I'm happy that everybody has this moment in question. Oh, sorry. 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 Even better. Okay. Uh, I am an engineer. And my, my first work is in, I, I sell, I sell intelligent uh, systems for buildings. Well, and uh, what we sell are engineering solutions. The architect is not uh, yet, I hope, uh, intervening in this type of market. And uh, well, what I see is uh, the architect tries to intervene in the active and intelligent systems. And what I saw in the two of uh, his inter interventions here, uh, in uh, a way that uh, I think it's not uh, the main concern of the architecture because there are problems that are not uh, yet uh, uh, treated by uh, architects that could be, for example, those spaces. And I insist in that it's possible to, the space nowadays can be perfectly mobile. And uh, why not to, to think about uh, mobile spaces in, a, in, a, in the design of the dwelling and so on? And uh, well, there are already some experiments in, in that. Uh, but that is a concern that is not uh, well, some beautiful colors in the wall, but it's uh, we saw in the morning uh, uh, the, how to optimize the space in, uh, in office. Why not? Why movements of the, of the walls, of the ceilings and so on to organize? And that is uh, something that better than the engineer who would provide the technical solution, but the architects must think about those you know, real deep questions on the organization of space. I know we put this, uh, this question, why not? Thank you, thank me. So lovely is what you think about the material. But those uh, very special materials are very, very expensive. The, uh, the most uh, common thing we have is uh, intelligent uh, glass. Uh, intelligent glass can uh, substitute the entire envelope of the, of the buildings. Uh, but it's, and uh, it's also very expensive, uh, a complete, uh, complete uh, 
operation for us is very expensive. Uh, so it's not for uh, today, but we must see the program. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, me and Franklin, we are friends. <laughs> <laughs> me and Franklin, we do this uh, since 15 years ago. And I'm not an engineer. <laughs> but I would, like, I would like to remind Franklin that uh, early modernism was um, highly um, motivated also by materials, concrete, uh, glass, and steel. And I cannot think about some modern architects and the shapes that they develop it without thinking that those um, approaches to design were provided or were was able because they dealt with the with the potentiality of the new materials like concrete, glass, and steel. I cannot think about, for instance, the Brazilian architect um, Nehemiah, for instance, uh, with those very curvilinear plastic forms. So I think, yes, it's, 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 you are absolutely, I agree with this, that architects' um, main concern should be space, and totally agree with that. But I think that the perspective on that focus can, can be from different point of views. And materials is one of it. So I, I really don't agree with you. So this was going quite well. This was going quite smooth. So um, until now, because I think that uh, materials is one of the perspectives that architects can have uh, in, in terms of a new, um, uh, um, new insights about uh, about uh, shapes, about um, uh, the way uh, architecture can be thought and can be designed. And for me, that's a very uh, important movement, moment, sorry, in modern movement uh, regarding the possibilities that concrete, glass, and steel uh, uh, brought to the to, to what architects could do with the shape. With the, with the with the with the, vo with the uh, voluntary of the of the, of the buildings, I think it's it's a very interesting legacy that we can still explore. So I don't agree with you when you say that about the the main concern of the architects is space and not materials. Yes, it is, but I can look at space and think about space from a material point of view. Um, material in terms of uh, the the. The, the, the elements that I use to confirm, to, to, to configurate my, my, my architecture. So this is something that I would like to add to increase the discussion and to say that... Uh, I'm sorry, was that comment for me, right? No, 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 no. 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 Oh, oh, okay. For my good. friend Franklin. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. My good old friend at Franklin. <laughs> There is I have something to say. I have, I have your back. I have to say something because we are now at a moment that where materials are not in the hands of the material engineers or not in the hands, not only on the hands of the engineer, civil, civil engineer. We are talking at a level where materials are explored at the chemical, at the physics, the physics, chemistry, yeah. right? So I think that the issue, it's not... Uh, how we could implement that materials. I think the issue is how could we architects work with other specialists, specialists that yeah, yeah, uh, um, completely domain these areas, yeah. and how could we bring this uh, at a at a good way in architecture, and how could we translate it into space? I, I, I think that that we it's not. It is money. The question most of the times it is the costs of all of these researches more than the cost of the, the production of the materials, because the research uh, to study these materials are very high. We are talking about years, sometimes decades, and and they they are very expensive to do. But the the, step, the the challenge in architecture today for me it's how could we architects integrate in our architectural lexicon. The other lexicons of the other uh, disciplines. Totally agree with you. 
you're not you are not biting him, you are, you are biting him. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> okay. Can we finish now? Yes, I think so. Yeah. So thank you all for this wonderful session. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes, restart uh, at, in oh, five okay. min in six minutes. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, 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 sorry, no, no. sorry, half no, no. past 21 minutes. In 21, 21 minutes, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Não deve ver assim tão mal, senão é possível. Tá bom. Eu não cheguei Eu disse que é de cidadania. São essas diferenças. Olha, muito interessante. Muito bom. Acho um piadão esta ideia de fazer multimídia. O que é que está a fazer? Eu vou deixar cheio de luz, passam a ação.